Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the It's My Job podcast. Welcome to episode number 17. This is Jose. I am a transition student from Colorado. And my teacher, Mrs. Christine Dolly, is the podcast facilitator. The It's My Job podcast features students interviewing adults who are blind or visually impaired, investigating important questions like how they use technology and how they connect with other people. Stay tuned after the podcast to learn how to get involved. And please, Share with your friends and teachers so they can listen too. Now for the interview. Caden is interviewing Ted. Ted is a accessibility analyst at Fable and he also owns his own consulting. Let's listen to Caden's interview with Ted. Okay, so my first question is, what does a typical day look like for you? Well, um, the more appropriate, since I'm blind, is what does the typical day sound like? Oh, okay. You know, I'm just teasing. That's I get up in the morning, I take care of showering, grooming, all that, daily living skills. And then t- they get me into my wheelchair once all that's done, get in front of the computer. And so I'm basically in front of the computer for six to eight hours a day, unless Duran and I figure something else out to do. So I, my, my day... The mass of my day is primarily in front of this computer, either doing audio editing or creation, doing um, accessibility analysis tickets for a company in Canada called Fable. And then just trying to keep myself busy, whether it's reading audiobook and responding to a few emails that might be good to respond to and going through text messages and looking at uh, my financial app, such as Robin Hood mm-hmm. and Stash and seeing how the markets are going. So that's pretty much it. My typical day. Okay, cool. So my next question is, what got you interested in a job related to accessibility? When I was in grade school and high school, I had a large part of my my school. I was in parochial school, so I did not have the advantages of public school and state funding for accessibility stuff. But once I did get into public school in eighth grade, ninth grade through 12th grade, I was, I learned about what a CCTV was, heavy roll paper. And of course, my vision was slowly diminishing. I didn't know about access technology until I transitioned myself from high school to college. Texas Commission for the Blind, coupled with a world-renowned hospital here in Houston's Medical Center called, it used to be called Texas Institute for Rehabilitation and Research, collaborated on a computer system for me to be able to use efficiently, effectively towards the objective being able to type papers for college professors. Because when you go to college, unlike high school, professors don't take handwritten material. They make it mandatory to have it printed. So I needed to find a way I could use the computer, both with vision loss that was deteriorating and problems with my hands. I have amputations to all of my fingers. So I needed an alternative navigation and typing device to input. Uh, Dragon Dictate, which is now called Dragon Naturally Speaking, was one of the things I was evaluated with, but being a screen reader user and not liking to wear earphones, the voice input and voice output with text-to-speech was not an option because you have a problem with a feedback loop. And so they came up with a way for me to type utilizing an expanded version of Morse code. The technology I used then is very similar to the technology I use now, uh, but they are different products. And unfortunately, I just found out that the device that I use now uh, called West Test Engineering has ceased manufacturing this product. So fortunately, I have three of these devices because I at one time I had three different computers. The two of the three are put in my file cabinet. And so if one breaks, then I've got two in reserve. But if they ever all break, I really have to wonder, what am I going to do to do input on a computer in the future? But that's what got me interested in in technology, because at first, once I got into college and got into computers, I thought computers were far more fascinating than people's minds. And so that's kind of what encouraged me into the computer and then as a result of that access technology. The third question I have for you is, what is an accessibility analyst? Let's just say, let's use Walmart or Amazon as an example. They come to a company and they they want to know that their website is accessible to all all forms of disability because there's not just blind. There's not just the screen reader user. There's the magnification user. There's the alternate navigation input user, whether it be like my switches or like somebody using Dragon, somebody using eye gaze, say if they have 
ALS or something like that, or a voice box, and I don't know how to describe So there's a myriad of different disabilities that, that, uh, that people have, but still want access to the digital world, be it Amazon, Walmart, Groupon, DoorDash, and I could go on and on. Just like when the A- Americans with Disabilities Act was put into effect in 1990 with the help of George Bush Sr., that was written at the time for physical barriers such as curb cuts, inaccessible bathrooms due to no grab bars, or widened toilet stalls for people with large wheelchairs, not just small wheelchairs, but large wheelchairs for, say, bariatric wheelchair users and such. And so as we have progressed from the physical world into the digital world, provisions need to be made on all public websites, just like public buildings and even private buildings for that matter, that allow the public to come in and do commerce and trading and such. We need to make it bar- as barrier-free as we possibly can within within the local state, federal laws of the United States and other countries. So my job is to go through workflows that the customer and the management of my company set out. And I, as an alternate navigation user, as well as a screen reader user, but primarily in this context, the alt nav switch user will go through this workflow, find problems or pain points as they sometimes call it. And then I do a write up section by section, step by step in this this workflow journey and say, okay, this heading didn't work right, or I couldn't make this activate, or I couldn't make this combo box read properly. And because I use two or more technologies for accessibility, then I can write on both. But my primary objective is to make sure that things work with my switch navigation. And so I'm analyzing the website for problems with accessibility through a given workflow. And then if there is no problems, I, at the end of the workflow, I have an opportunity to write down highlights and commend the company for this particular, particularly good workflow. So I I can give negative feedback and positive feedback. Cool. Okay. So since you were born with retinitis pigmentosa, how did you adjust to losing your vision over time? I love that question. I, um, well, I was adopted at birth, so I never knew what exactly my, where my disabilities came from, except for RP, retinitis pigmentosa, because I knew that it was degenerative. I knew it was hereditary and I've done my own research and I had a very, very good RP specialist, uh, growing up in again in the medical center in the Herman Eye Center as a matter of fact in downtown Houston. And so I I knew what to expect from as young as five years old. I can recall probably around three or four years of age still being able to see stars but barely. And then by the time I turned five and was diagnosed, I couldn't see the stars anymore at all. Uh, I could still see the moon quite clearly, but uh, I also rapidly lost any kind of night night vision, uh, which is basically the first stages of RP. And my mother was always very encouraging. She she knew I was going to go blind eventually, just we never knew when. Uh, my case is a classic case, though I'm told every person that has RP, every case is unique in some way or form. No two are exactly alike. I knew that um, I would need help eventually. Now, as I said earlier, I went to a parochial school. I went to a Montessori school from kindergarten through second grade, a Lutheran school from third through seventh grade. And so in those two school environments, I was not given any state help. And so, and I, I probably was at a great disadvantage not going to public school. But to answer your question, I started getting state help from eighth grade on like large print textbooks, for example, heavy ruled paper. I had already started using those uh, heavy black marker type pens, those 2020 pens, I think they're called. And then using just a little bit cassette, uh, books on cassette. But I always thought that books on cassette were really difficult to use unless I got them from the state library and it was a novel or something on those little four track tape recorders. That was easy to use if it wasn't a really, really long book. The textbooks, when you have 35 cassettes to deal with, it's not easy. (laughs) And and there are even fewer when she get to college. So I rely heavily on cassette uh, recordings of uh, lectures in college once I got to college. And sometimes I had to use hired help like a reader uh, and things like that. 
Uh, I tried to use as much of my usable vision at the time. And by the way, I did not go totally blind until after I graduated college. That made things significantly easier for me in terms of navigating the school, using a scooter. And um, I did use a cane begrudgingly during high school for navigation. But I was able to, I, I adapted well. In fact, my mantra has been forever because of losing my my eyesight and losing my fingers bit by bit due to amputations is adapt and overcome. And losing my vision very slowly and losing my fingers from one amputation to another, I actually had to sort of adapt how I wrote because like I said, I used to write my term papers and things, do my homework, all handwritten in, in grade school. And so each time I lost a little bit of bone in a finger, especially my right hand, I would have to figure out how to hold that pen again so that I could continue writing because I didn't have a computer yet, not until I started college. So <laughs> I've always had a positive attitude. And if I do get depressed, it may last a day or two, maybe three at the most, but I don't dwell on it because that's not healthy and that's not a part of my makeup. So I always say adapt and overcome. All right, cool. What features or workarounds do you use in life and on the job to make things accessible? All right. In life, as in the job, as I said, I use two platform switches. They plug into a device called Darcy USB. There's an, and they plug in via like a little headphone jack. There's a headphone jack A, B, and C. A represents dot. B represents dash. You guessed it. Morse code. C represents a third switch. Should I need it? which I don't. Uh, and that's used more in training or teaching somebody Morse code and the various codes that you need to memorize to be able to type. Okay, so then, then the Darcy device, as the name implies, plugs into a USB port on the computer. It, it is transparent to the computer, so it doesn't use any of the computer's system resources. It translates the Morse code into ASCII text and other keyboard commands to operate the computer. So I can type A, B, C, just like in typing a notepad, one, two, three for numbers. I can use the modifier keys, such as, and it has built-in sticky key because it's effectively me typing with one finger, even though I'm using two switches. So if I want to do, say, Alt F4, I can do the Alt command and then the F4 command, and that closes out the program. I can do, say, Control and then W, and that closes out whatever window I'm in, say, in Chrome. Insert, of course, JAWS has insert mode, uh, and that's why I use JAWS over NVDA, but I'm going to be talking with somebody soon about how to fix that. I can do a sticky key for insert and then J, and that, of course, launches the JAWS window, for example, or insert F4 to turn JAWS off. So that's how I input to JAWS. And then, as I said, using JAWS as my primary screen reader or text-to-speech, which allows me to be able to know what I am doing on the computer as auditory feedback. Okay, that's how I basically operate my laptop or desktop or whatever computer I'm using. I have an Alexa device. How many of those did I set off just now? <laughs> but I, I've got an Alexa device and then I can, you know, turn on iHeartRadio to local stations or whatever, or, or the, my local radio reading service. I can get on NFB Newsline. I can turn on my TV. I can make, uh, I can say, if it's available, I can say ECHO, watch Terminator on Netflix. And then it'll send a code or a command to my television, my Toshiba television, which is also Alexa enabled. It'll launch that app. And hopefully if that movie is available and it's free, then it'll launch the movie and I can enjoy it and I can watch the movie. And I've already got it all set up that if the content is audio described, it'll also play audio described. So that's how mm -hmm. we entertain ourselves or I entertain myself with those devices. I use a wheelchair. I've not been in this building more than about two weeks and three days quarantined to the room. So I haven't been able to explore this facility yet. But two facilities ago, prior to the whole COVID mess, I was able to get around most of the building fine because a friend that I have met at Woodridge, my original nursing home, he met, he and I met at the nurse's station some eight years ago, and we talked for three days straight before he realized I was totally blind. He took it upon himself to orientate me to the entire building. And the way he described the building was really cool. He said it looked like a, a jackhammer meets a tuning fork. 
And that description of the floor plan was so spot on. It made it so easy for me to get around that building. And I hope that in time, once we get established here, somebody, probably Joanne, since I didn't have Joanne back then, but I have Joanne now, she can you know, orientate me to the rest of the building at some point. Since Joanne and I have been together for Valentine's Day, we'll have made two years as a couple. So I, I rely on her to, to help be my eyes and be my hands in a lot of cases. Either she's going to do it or we'll do it. And she's a sweetheart for putting up with me. <laughs> so <laughs> lockdown is lifted and we can get back to life as normal. She and I go to go out to eat at least once a week, maybe sometimes twice a week. Uh, we are involved with our local chapter of ACB, American Council of the Blind, called Houston Council of the Blind. We're also involved in a blind users group called iBug, iBugToday.org. And that is an organization that teaches blind folks how to use various eye devices, be it the phone or the watch or the TV. And they even have an online meeting for the iMac. Pretty involved with that, both on a user group and a social level. And then uh, Joanne and I just like getting out and going to Walmart and Hobby Lobby and out to eat and things like that too. So I wouldn't yeah. do quite as much of the outside stuff except for the iBug and the HCB stuff. I wouldn't go to Walmart by myself. I just wouldn't. It wouldn't be safe and it wouldn't be practical. But since Joanne and I are together, we make a really good team. I get on my phone and get on the Walmart app and we're sh stop shopping for stuff. I'll do a search for it. I'll come up with the aisle number and then we'll have an assistant usually helping us because she's driving a scooter and the assistant is pushing my wheelchair. And I can say, okay, the Velcro is on N32 or the salad dressing is at J16. So she's the eyes and she's the hands and I work the technology so that we make our lives easy and efficient. Same thing is when we're ordering things online since we can't go there we have this stuff come to us so okay cool my next question is i know that you have a college degree however is a bachelor's degree required to be an accessibility analyst i'm not sure when i got involved with fable i don't recall ever having to i don't remember telling them that i had a bachelor's degree because the way I got in touch with Fable, it was kind of a kind of an accident, actually. Joanne and I had just moved from the other nursing home in an attempt to move into a setting where there was institutional structure and rules. So we moved into a personal care home, which actually turned out to be a very disastrous. But we did not stay in that environment. But in that process, a lady I know in California who is a web designer, if I may, can I can I put my website? So the website is www.galanosconsulting.com. And I'll spell it www, of course, dot G as in George, A-L-A-N as in November, O. S as in Sam, consulting, C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G.com. Sarah also was working on a website for another fella in Maine who was a, an accessibility analyst for Fable by way of using Dragon Naturally Speaking. And he had told Sarah that they were looking for switch users. Sarah said, I know the perfect person. So she got me in touch. They liked how I went through the workflow. Fortunately, I had a a very small bit of experience through another company that I had done a few of these things for called utest.com. And so I kind of knew what they were looking for. And I, I treated this just like I did utest. And so they said, okay, you're a perfect fit. Get the necessary documents together. You electronically sign them and you'll start being able to take on tickets. Again, to answer your question directly, I don't remember if a bachelor's is required. I'm going to say I doubt it. I think what they're looking for is people that have experience in the access technology they use on a daily basis. So then, and you, you can proficiently and intelligently go through a workflow and your writing skills are good, then that that's the major requirement is just knowing and just knowing your equipment, be it software or hardware, whether it be a PC, a Mac, Apple or Android, just knowing your equipment. How did you remain motivated and accept your disabilities? 
And I tell you, I will tell, and I should have said this earlier on, but it, this is a good place to fit this in. I am very much a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, as does my wife, Joanne. And if I did not have Jesus Christ in my life from a very early child to present and forever till eternity, I probably wouldn't make it. I have been on death's doorstep at least twice in my life. Uh, the two most recent was October of 2019, when I had pneumonia that was pulmonary failure. In January of 2015, a more severe case of pulmonary failure due to pneumonia, two strikes, but without God and actually without Joanne, I would not be as positive as, as I am, I believe. Having met her in the nursing home, most definitely a godsend and a blessing. But prior to Joanne and throughout our relationship, prior to Joanne, I'm going all the way back to childhood and my entire life. God has been my strength. And then, as I said before, adapt and overcome was my motto and mantra, and always find a way to keep some shred of independence. The older I get and the worse my disabilities become and more advanced, my blindness can't get any worse because I'm totally blind. My fingers, I think, are because I can't use my hands as much as I did in my youth, I'm not, I'm still susceptible to injury. But because I'm not nearly as active as I was as a child, uh, I don't sustain the injuries I used to with my hands. I get them more with my feet because I use my feet to help propel this wheelchair. So I do still have to be careful with that. I do my very best, be it with a social outlet through computer, Zoom, Skype, when we are allowed to get out, the various organizations I've become affiliated with, HCD, iBug, I, I can keep a positive attitude because I can keep mentally active. Even if my body has failed me, I can mentally be strong and act. Oh, and by the way, I do go adaptive water skiing. Yes, somebody oh, cool. that's blind and in a wheelchair can water ski. There's an that's outfit. awesome. <laughs> There's an outfit here in Houston and they do go to other places around Texas. And they, they even have, a, I forget it's a three day or five day event up in North Dakota uh, where they teach disabled kids and adults from as young as five to I've heard as old as 85, maybe older, how to water ski. And yes, you can water ski sitting down. You don't have to hold the tow rope because part of the sit ski will hold the tow rope for you if you can't they have skied people that have autism they have skied people that have down syndrome they have skied people that are an l4 paraplegic blind in my case and in a wheelchair joanne has gone water skiing twice now a couple of summers ago when we were still allowed to leave this building and been associated with them for gosh this will be the 21st year suffice it to say even if you're blind wheelchair or both or some other disability you can do it. I've done it. You can do it too. Good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so my next question is, what advice do you have for blind and low vision students to be successful in life and in the workplace? First of all, if you've got a dream, live the dream. Follow your dream as best as you can. Uh, and I do come from a broken home like many of us do. Adapt and overcome. The further we progress in, in life with technology advancing at a such a rapid pace. The world is our oyster. We can do just about everything anybody else can do. I am, I'm hoping that I can help by removing the digital barriers through what I do with Fable and other things, uh, just as the Americans with Disabilities Act was designed to remove physical barriers from the physical world. If there is a barrier that you encounter, don't approach it in a negative way because negativity does not work. I used to get very angry at people and things if they didn't do things right the way I thought they logically should be done. And you get more flies with honey than you do vinegar. So don't approach things in a combative nature. Approach things in a logical and practical diplomatic manner and you'll get far more accomplished. Don't approach things as a pity party or you're owed something because nobody owes you anything. Accommodations can be made. Yes. And sometimes, and I'm not saying it's right and I'm not saying it's wrong. Sometimes you have to take the bull by the horns, make those accommodations for yourself. And that proves to the employer that you're a self-starter and that will work wonders if you have that kind of ambition. Awesome. The last question I have is, what do you see yourself doing in the future? I and my wife will probably be living in a nursing home for the rest of our lives, largely because I'm a total care 
patient. I see my working with Fable as contract worker. It, it supplements me financially, but it's sort of things that I do anyway. I love teaching people JAWS and the iPhone, teaching people how to use their access technology. I've done a, over the years, I've done a lot of it. You know, they get a new computer and they're not really sure that it may be new to Windows 10, for example. And I've been using Windows 10 for probably three or four years now. Yeah, I hope to continue with Fable. I hope to uh, continue my audio editing and, and custom audio design freelance stuff with Audacity. I, I love using Audacity for creating karaoke and site that I'm a part of called Out hyphen of hyphen site, S-I-G-H-T dot net. Uh, that is a very cool place to go for, for a social outlet online. They use the Team Talk uh, voice chat client. They have an associated internet radio station. I've done promos and stuff for their radio station. Just, that's pretty much in a nutshell what the future holds for, for me and, and my wife. And hopefully this lockdown will get lifted and we can get out of the building and explore this new side of Houston we're living on. Well, thank you for doing this. My pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I have too. If I may, can I can I put my website and phone number in the recording? The website is www.galanosconsulting.com and I'll spell it www of course. Dot G as in George, A L A N as in November, O S as in Sam, consulting, C O N S U L T I N G. Dot com and my Google Voice phone number is 713-396 Three, four, nine, five. What grade you're in at this point and what college you're going to? What are you going to be majoring in? So at the moment, I have graduated high school and I'm in a program in Council Bluffs Isle called 4 Plus. And this is a program where we practice independent living skills before we go out in the world and do it ourselves. So this program gives us an opportunity to kind of find our skills and improve them as well as getting social skills as well. This sounds a lot like what Chris Cole is in Austin, Texas. The Chris Cole Institute is a place where I actually attended for part of most of the summer of 1992, allowed me to get, take a class or two at uh, Austin Community College. I was in a dorm-like setting. There was independent living skills training. I think there might have even been a small technology lab, but I didn't ever see that. Cool. All right, guys, it has been fun. I've enjoyed this. I, if you guys want me to be a part of an interview again, I'd be more than happy to. Hi, it's Jose again. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the It's My Job podcast. What do you think? Do you like adaptive sports? Also, would you like to have a career as a accessibility analyst to make websites and games accessible for people who are blind or visually impaired? Let us know by posting a comment on our Facebook. You can share your thoughts by phone or email. If you have any questions for Ted, we would be happy to pass them along. And we might even share your questions and answers in a future episode of the It's My Job podcast. The phone number is 202 6 Eight eight five zero four four. Again, that's two zero two six eight eight five zero four four. Outside of the United States, you may need to dial plus one or one and your international access code. Be sure to check with your parents first. You can call us and leave us a voicemail, or you can send us a text message. The email address is askitismyjob at gmail dot com. Again, that's. A S K I T S M Y J O B at gmail dot com. No spaces and no apostrophe. Are you new to the It's My Job podcast? If so, welcome. We want you to know that you can find us on Facebook. Just search for It Is My Job. Each of our episodes is also on the Perkins Path for Technology blog. Check us out and leave us a comment at PerkinsLearning dot org slash technology. And finally, we also have a YouTube channel called It Is My Job. If you missed episode number 16, head over to YouTube or Facebook to hear the interview with Riley and Dr. Mona and hear all about bioengineering and filmmaker. This was our 17th episode, but we want to make many more and we need your help. If you are a student who is blind or visually impaired and would like to be an interviewee or an adult who is blind or visually impaired and would like to be an interviewee, please send us an email and or a Facebook message. Please have your teacher or parents contact us 
via phone, email, or our Facebook. And we will get you matched up with an interviewee. Once again, our phone number for voicemails and text messages is 202-688-5044. Our email address is askitismyjob at gmail.com. We have a lot to be thankful for in this episode. Thanks so much to Ted for sharing his time. This interview was facilitated by my teacher, Mrs. Christine Dolly. Thank you, Ms. Dolly, for providing students with meaningful opportunities to experiment with what you always tell us. You don't need sight, you need a vision. Thanks to Perkins Path for technology for the vlog posts. Our music is from purpleplanet.com. With so many of us working and studying from home, we hope that this podcast is becoming a great opportunity to learn from each other and increase awareness about all the amazing jobs that are being done by people who are blind or visually impaired.